Uh, I wear a mask for a couple different reasons. The first reason is my older sisters told me I look better wearing a mask. <laughs> you know how older sisters can be, yeah. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, in the Archdiocese of uh, Minneapolis where I serve, we've been having about two priests uh, suffer with COVID every week. This past week, we've had over 24 taken out of ministry. So that's a big jump, and so I wear the mask for protecting you because I don't know. Uh, I just don't want to have somebody say, you know, that priest came for food for the poor from Minneapolis and we all got sick, so that's why I'm wearing the mask. I'm trying to do the best I can. It's, it's what Peter was saying to Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was not a Christian, uh, but he was interested in the faith. And Peter looked at Cornelius and he said, if you remember, he said, I recognize that God calls, like you, Cornelius, people who have a fear of God and are upright. And these people are acceptable to God. Now, fear of God is not like, oh, I'm afraid that God is going to get me. Fear of God is more like the whole idea of, well, let me give you an example. Sometimes when I'm working with people, they'll have a foul word or an expletive, and then they'll say, oh, excuse me, Father, forgive my French. Uh, they don't want to offend me. Well, fear of God in the Old Testament is you don't want to do anything that you believe will offend God. So whether you're a Christian or not, you know, sort of say, well, God would not approve of that. Being upright is more difficult because, you know, depending on who you are and where you're at, you may disagree about what is upright. But if you strive to be upright, then God says, I take that into consideration. That's acceptable when you're striving to be upright. But I ask myself, if a non-believer can be in good favor for God if they have a fear of God in that other way, not to offend and to try to do what is right, then what makes me different as a Christian? Well, that's the last line, where Jesus looks at where the father looks at Jesus and says, you are my son and I am well pleased. In the opening prayer of the collect, we said, God, internally transform us, which means is continually help us to understand not how I can become better, but, but how truly I am meant to be in relationship with God and neighbor. So one of the reasons why I'm coming you here this weekend is to preach for food for the poor. Now, I'm not going to do your regular thing, which is the whole idea of saying, you know, there's poor people in the world and they need your help. They have extreme poverty. Uh, you know, imagine the people in Haiti, uh, imagine the people in Kentucky or different places where, you know, they've had natural disasters. Uh, imagine people who are starving or can't get medical care. It's, it's usually the way that people say, and, and you can help them. I'm not here to do that. I've done that all my life. You know, as the priest, you're expected to do that. But about three or four years ago, I started preaching for food for the poor because of my experience in a parish. And the experience in the parish sort of transformed my way of looking at giving to the poor. Uh, when I got there, it was already in operation. It was a group of people who went to the local supermarket a few years before I came. It was called Cub Foods. It's like your Deerbergs or Schnooks or whatever you have. You know, the real large change one, chain ones. They went to Cubs and they said, we recognize that you throw out a lot of things, baked goods, you know, uh, produce or whatever. We would like to come and pick it up and take it to the poor. And the manager said, well, we would like to do that, but we tried it before, and the people just didn't show up. And so the people from my parish, St. Rita, said, give us a chance. Uh, agree to give it to us for two months, and we'll show you that we will show up. Now, in Minneapolis, it can be tough showing up, because, you know, when I left there on Friday morning, the ambient or the real temperature was minus 18. That wasn't with the windshield factor. And you know when it's snowing and ice in the roads, it's sort of like, you say, oh, I don't know if I want to show up. But they showed up. And after two months, Cubs Food said, all right, we'll keep on doing it. As long as you keep on showing up, we'll give you our leftovers. 
and you take it to the poor. And the first year that I was there, Cub Foods told them that in the previous year, they had taken or received two tons of baked goods. Now, sometimes a loaf of bread is only a pound. So that's 4,000 loaves of bread that would have been thrown out that the poor would not have gotten simply because the people in the parish said, we'll get it to the poor. That's why I preach for food for the poor. Because they are a known organization who not only collect for the poor, but they get it to the poor. It's not easy getting it to the poor. If you're like in Haiti, uh, or other countries, they're due primarily in the Caribbean, Latin America, but they also help out in the United States, is that, you know, sometimes you can't get through. And when you have goods you can't get through, you can just leave it sit there, or you can move it to another place where it can get through to them so that they can use it. In fact, in my parish at St. Joseph the Worker, we have a sister parish in Boozy, Haiti. And after the earthquake... It was a lot of destruction. They were hungry. They were starving. We had all the money that we could give them to be able to, for them to pay for the food, but they couldn't get the food. So we contacted Food for the Poor, and Food for the Poor contacted Feed My Starving Children. Feed My Starving Children is a, a big organization that takes a lot of bulk foods and makes individual meals that can be given out. Uh, that is, you know nutritious for that particular area. And so Food for the Poor got the food that was already in Haiti for Feed My, Fiving, Feed My Starving Children and got it to our sister parish. I was proud and I thought to myself is that no matter how much money we had, we couldn't get it there. But there was another organization who could get it there and it was Food for the Poor. Now, again, it's not just that I preach for food for the poor because I want the poor to be helped. But, well, let me give you an example. Have you ever gone into the store and seen a sign, two for the price of one? Have you ever picked it up because you thought, well, I could use it? Sometimes you'll see two for one sale, and then in the small print, they usually put it in small print, they say, second one, 50% off. Now, if you're like me, you sort of say, you have to now start figuring. Is it worth it for me to buy the second one, even though I don't need it right now, because I'm going to get a deal out of it? You been in that situation? So I'm looking for deals. Inward transformation is the simple thing of not only asking ourselves, how do the poor get it, but can they get him a deal? When was the last time you gave to the poor, in which you said, I'm going to give because this will give the poor a deal. For most of my life, I never asked about getting a deal for the poor. I just simply said, well, I got this, I'll give it, and it'll get there, and that'll help. But I never asked or thought about getting a deal for the poor. Now, in 2019, that's the last time for the year that Food for the Poor was able to give its annual report, 80% of their donated goods came from large corporations. So not one for one, or two for one, or three for one, or four for one, but five for one of everything that was given came from larger corporations who said, we know you can get it to the poor, so we will give it to you. I think to myself, I want to be a person who looks for deals for the poor. Because if I can get even twice, I mean, you know, we do it in the public realm. Is it, uh, Right now, they, you know, some charities, or I think it was NPR I was listening to, they said, you know, if you give this much, we have a matching grant. And so people will say, well, if I give $100, somebody else will give $100. That makes $200 because of me. Sure, I'll do it. 
Food for the poor is something that allows you to double, triple, quadruple, depending upon the year and what the corporations are giving, a lot more for the poor. For me, I think God is pleased by that. I, I recognize, you know, that in, in when God gives his talents, you know, the person who just sort of buried it and, or even the one who just gave it back, it's, it's like giving back, you know, I, I'm going to give you some of what you gave me. But the ones who, who said, here, I'm giving you two more. I'm giving you five more. Jesus said, all right, and now I'm going to give you more. The whole idea is that we're supposed to optimize. That's why I preach for food for the poor. Because it gets it to the poor and it gets a good deal for the poor. I want to just tell you one more story. Is My first assignment was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I met this family, mom and dad, who had two young daughters. And at that time in the church, you could bring things that you bought in the store, put it in the baskets in the back, and somebody would take it to the poor every week. So they had their daughters, when they went out shopping for the meals, they had their daughters pick something out. And every time they went out shopping, they picked up something for the poor. Now, as the daughters grew and the daughter, first daughter went into college, she had like an apartment or a, you know, in school, a pod, I don't know what they call it, three or four together. And, um, and so the daughter would go out and have a, a basket or a, uh, I don't know, something for the poor. And she would always buy things for the poor. And she would leave it there until she could take it to the poor. And one day, her roommates ran out of food. <laughs> and they said, uh, can we have the things in the basket? And she said, no, that's for the poor. And when she went home and told her parents, can you imagine how her parents felt? They were pleased. You know, the daughter went off to college, but she, it was inside of her is that it's important to be aware of the poor. So, you know, you, there's pamphlets inside the, the pews. You can find one. It'll tell you more, a little bit more about the practical realities of food for the poor. If you're a person that wants to say is that I, I can't, send food, but maybe if I find a deal, I'll, I'll give $5 or $7. $7 a month if you give that, or even one time, it pays for two meals for one person every day for a month. That's a pretty good deal, <laughs> you know, any way you look at it. And so I ask you to consider there is a basket in the back of the church. I'm not taking a second collection up. You know, simply put the money in the basket, put it in the envelope, uh, you can put your name on it. You can put a check. You don't even have to, uh, you can take an envelope home. I encourage you to do it and take it with you. Put it up on your refrigerator or someplace that you see it. And whenever you decide to give something to the poor, just simply put it in the envelope, seal it, put it in the mail, and then send it in and it'll get to food for the poor and it'll get to the poor. And I say to myself is, you know, the next time you go out to the supermarket or anywhere and see a wonderful deal instead of say, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get this because this is a good deal. Then go back and take that envelope and say, is this the day that I give a good deal to the poor as well? Now let us stand.